better. But uh, it's been a good morning, and we are glad that you're here. My name is Pastor Chris. As I mentioned, we got Pastor Kevin over here in the yellow in the front row. And uh, many people call me Pastor Chris. Uh, I used to pastor in Wasika, Minnesota, where where there's literally thousands of people there who call me Pastor Chris. Even to this day, if I went to Walmart, there are people, hey, Pastor Chris, how are you doing? You know, some of them don't even know that I left three and a half years ago. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, some of those who even went to my church, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> But, but a lot of people call me Pastor Chris, and that, that, that's okay, that's fine. Um, some people call me Mr. Myrose, of course, or if it's a telemarketer, I often get Mr. Melrose. That's when I know to hang up, of course, because there's no L in my last name. Uh, other people call me Chris. A lot of my friends just call me Chris. My mother, at times, growing up, um, would call me Christopher Lee. And whenever those words would come out, you knew nothing good had been happening, and nothing good was going to come in my side of the equation, anyhow. Um, I'm Uncle Chris to a couple of kids. I I am, of course, pastor. I'm a teacher. I'm a leader, a minister, all sorts of titles and positions and and names. And all of those titles, of course, work for me. And and you, of course, wouldn't be wrong if you came up to me and said, hey, Christopher Lee, how are you doing today? Except for that'd be a little weird, right? Probably not inappropriate, but not quite appropriate, just kind of odd and awkward. And you you wouldn't be wrong, though, because Christopher Lee is my my actual birth name. most people just, though, call me Pastor Chris. And it depends on your relationship. Within that relationship, it defines how you address the other people or other persons. And that's the way most of life works for us, right? Um, but there are some people who have unique categories. And I'm going to show you some pictures of one of those unique ones, if, if Ruth will throw those up here for you. Um, there's one person who has a very unique relationship with me, and it'd be this little guy. He turned 10 a little over a week ago. His name is Justice. They're not here today because, well, to make a long story short, they drove to New York State early Thursday morning. They got to Niagara Falls yesterday afternoon. They were originally going there to pick up a puppy that had been sold while they were driving to New York State. So now they're in New York State, and they might go see the Statue of Liberty and have an adventure. Uh, we will see what comes of this trip. But nonetheless, they're not here because they're on the other side of the continent. Um, but he's the only little guy, you can see his pictures there, that's one of my favorites, I love that picture. Uh, 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 he, he's, he's the only person who gets to call me dad, right? And, and many of you, most of you probably, have met Justice. He's a great kid, a loving kid, uh, an affectionate kid. and He's this kid with lots of energy. He's kind of the, the, the wonderful frenetic explosion of joy when you meet him, right? Um, that, that, that describes my son pretty well. And, and he's my son. And he's never once that I know of called me Pastor Chris, right? <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't call me that. He, he's, he's certainly never called me Mr. Myros. That, that would be really weird. Um, He's never called me teacher. He's never called me Uncle Chris. He calls me Daddy or Dad. Or occasionally he calls me Dada. And he calls me that way because of this unique, special relationship that he and I share with one another. Uh, There's a way that he relates with me that is different than those who would call me Uncle Chris or, or, or different than those who would call me Pastor Chris or those who might call me teacher because yes, I am a teacher or, or whatever are the other roles that I fill. He, he has a different relationship. He calls me Daddy because there's a uniqueness in the relationship that we have with one another. Very different than anybody else in all of creation because he's my one and only child. And what we're going to look at in the Bible today is how we're supposed to and how we've been designed to relate to Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, uh, you feel free to open those up. There's some in the chairs in front of you, if not, or you can pop out an electronic device. Uversion is a good place to find a Bible if you need an app. We also have some Bibles out on the welcome stand you're welcome to keep. Um, But if you want to open up, we're going to be in John 3 exclusively today. John 3, 1 through 8. I'm not going to vary outside of that. So I would invite you, if you want to follow along, we're going to be in John 3, 1 through 8. And I'm going to read those verses to you here. And we'll throw them on the screen and you can follow along. But if you have a Bible, feel free to open it up. And I'm going to read those to you. And I'm going to have three points today. A good old Baptist three-point sermon today, all right? You you, you okay with that? That's what you get today. And uh, we're going to read John 3, 16. And then we're going to dig in and see what Jesus has to say from this passage. John 3, 6, or John 3, uh, 1 through 8, sorry. John 3, 1 through 8 says this. 
Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's three things that I want you to draw from these eight short verses today. And the very first one of those is simply this. Jesus is more than a teacher. He's a savior. It's important to know that Nicodemus is a serious man in this story. He's a serious man with serious questions. He's come to Jesus and he said a lot of right things about Jesus. He called Jesus rabbi, teacher, right? And that's true. Jesus had some followers who were following him and he was teaching them and that that made him qualified to be called a rabbi, right? That's true. He's a teacher. That's part of who he was. And we would do well to take Jesus as our teacher and to be serious about that. Jesus has much to say to us about, about life and how life works for our joy as well as for God's glory. And so Jesus is definitely a teacher, and he's a teacher, but he's more than that. He wants us to relate to him in a way that is greater than simply being our teacher. If you uh, are, some of you are in school now, and all of us at some point were in school, of course, right? You can relate to having had a, a good teacher in your past, right? And how you relate to your teachers, even good to not so good, uh, affects your relationships with them. And as you you relate to them, you you get a level of comfort and a level of expectation that comes in that relationship. But the way that you relate with that teacher, even for your very best teacher, is still not the same way that you would relate to a parent, for instance. Even though a parent teaches many things. But from a parent comes this desire of, or expectation of a, a higher level of intimacy. We expect safety and protection from a parent that a teacher doesn't provide. There's a level of vulnerability that we will give to a parent that we probably won't give to a teacher. The way that we relate is different. And in this passage here, Jesus is confronting Nicodemus a little bit because Nicodemus has it about half right, but he's still relating to Jesus wrong. I'll explain it, I guess, this way. The, the last, I don't know, couple of months have just been weird as far as my schedule goes. Usually as a pastor, summertime brings more of a regular schedule, less irregularities, more consistency, um, it, my, my normal summer kind of falls into a nice rhythm and pattern. But for whatever reason, this summer has been pandemonium and chaos, uh, including this trip to New York. My, my wife literally didn't decide to go until 2 a.m. Thursday, and they were on the road by 8 a.m. Thursday. Um, so it's just our, our, our summer has been, we put a roof on our house this summer. I was supposed to take a couple of days, but it kept raining. And you can't roof when it's raining, and so that throws your schedule off there. And it's just been weird things popping up here and there and everywhere, and just, just random things that, that just kind of have my, my schedule rhythm out of sync. And it just 
May, has made for just an odd, awkward, clunky summer as far as scheduling goes. It's been a great summer. It's just kind of been this herky-jerky schedule of a summer, however. And, and for whatever reason, a, a couple of weeks ago, I'd had a couple of night meetings. Um, I think we had a deacon's meeting, and we had praise team one night, and, and I don't remember all of what had gone on. But, but I'd had a couple of evening meetings, and so I come home from church, and uh, it's in the early evening, and I, I get home, and I walk in the door, and... Uh, as I, as I open the door, I, I hear this voice, Daddy! Right? And Justice comes running. We have a split-level home, and he's on that level of our entryway. He comes running and just about tackles me. Gives me, you know, his equivalent of a bear hug, right? Daddy, 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 Daddy! You know, just keeps saying, Daddy, Daddy! And keeps hugging me and just squeezing me. And after he stands there for a minute hugging me, he goes, I've missed you. And I'm like, I saw you like six hours ago. But okay, you know, I hug him and and then all right, great. I'm glad that he misses me. I guess that speaks good things. But had I walked in the door and he said, "Teacher," I would have been like, "What? That's weird." And had he come and met me at the door instead of uh, instead of hugging me, said, "Could you teach me something?" I would have been like, who is this little boy? Uh, it's not my son. He's somebody else. I don't know. I don't understand what's going on here. Yeah, that, that would have been weird, right? And it probably wouldn't have reflected good on our relationship had that been his approach to me. If my relationship with my son was about my vocation and not because I'm his daddy, then both of us are operating outside of the will and the work and the step of God's design for our relationship. And so kind of the same thing is occurring here with Nicodemus. Nicodemus starts coming and he says, Teacher, teacher, teacher. Right? Well, Jesus is a teacher. Yes. But don't miss this. Jesus is so much more than just a teacher. And so Jesus is confronting Nicodemus. He says, you've got it half right but you're relating to me in the wrong way. And if he's relating to him in the wrong way, well then, how is it we are supposed to relate to him? Well, thank you for asking that question. That's my next point. Um, the way we are supposed to relate to Jesus. He tells us right here in the scripture. Jesus says to relate to me that we must be born again of water and the spirit, not just of the flesh. Tricky question for you today. How many of you were born? It's not a trick question. We were all born, right? Every one of us was born. And when Jesus talks about this, when Jesus talks about being born of the flesh, he's saying that you and I were human beings. We, we were created, right? We were created in the image of God. And not only that, here's the good news, we are the crown jewel of all of creation. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. And what Jesus is saying within that, though, is because of that, we have a special status, a special relationship. And he expects us to relate to him in a different way than just in the flesh. Now, we need to relate to him in the flesh as our teacher, because we are human beings. But we need to go beyond that, because Jesus is so much more. When we relate to him in the flesh, if that's all we relate to him, we're going to be condemned because it's our flesh that is our failing. Because we are broken. We are a sinful people. And if we only relate to Jesus as teacher, that's not enough to save us. Because you see, there's a difference about knowing about somebody and knowing somebody, isn't there? Right? I could... I could read a, a sheet about you. It says how tall you are, how long you've lived, how much you weigh, where you lived. It might even tell me where you worked, and those kinds of informational items, right? But I just know of you. I don't know you. It becomes completely different if I 
come over to your house. You invite me over for dinner. We sit down. We start to share stories. You start to tell me about your childhood. You tell me where you met your husband or your wife. You start to tell me about your family, your children. You start to tell me about what makes you happy. You tell me who your favorite artist is and why you like this kind of music. You start to do those kinds of things. Now I begin to know you and not just know about you. If we relate to Jesus only in the flesh, if we come to Jesus just like Nicodemus saying, Teacher, well, that is true, but it's woefully incomplete. And so Jesus says, I want you to relate to me in the right way. You must not be just born of the flesh, but you need to be born of water and of the Spirit. So let me speak to that a little bit here. When Jesus says, Nicodemus, you need to be relating to me and born of the water. Well, if you've been here the last few weeks, we've kind of been talking about the early parts of the book of John, right? And earlier in the book of John, we had a a segment where the other John, John the baptizer, is down in the river Jordan baptizing people, right? And John's standing there down in the river Jordan baptizing people. He, He kind of creates a ruckus because kind of a revival begins to break up because all these people start coming to John and saying, I want to be baptized too. And John's in the water baptizing people in repentance. And he's, he, he's made such a commotion that the, that the bigwig religious leaders of his day are starting to wonder, what's going on out there? Why is this guy doing that? On what authority is he baptizing people out there? So they sent out some folks to go investigate, right? And they go out. Who are you? Are you... A prophet? No, no, I'm not a prophet. Are you... uh, Elijah? No, no, I'm not Elijah. Are you you the Messiah? No, but I am the one who comes heralding for him, he says, right? He says, I've come to pave the way for him. Make way. Here comes the Lord. And so Nicodemus is from among this group of people. When Jesus says, and starts talking about this, this being born of the water, I think what would have popped into his head is these events that were just going on right before this. Nicodemus would have been aware of it. Nicodemus knew of this revival that was going on. Nicodemus knew of these people being baptized in the water. And a revival is what happens when people begin to be spiritually renewed or, or coming to faith for the first time. And so there's this revival that's going on and All this great stuff is happening. And John's baptism, as he was baptizing people, was a baptism of repentance, as I said. And repentance is turning away from sin to know, love, and trust in Jesus. But not only are we turning away from something, as we turn away from one thing, we move towards another, right? And so as we turn away from those things, we start moving towards Jesus. Moving towards loving Him and trusting Him and following Him and obeying Him, right? That's what happens when we are relating to Jesus through the baptism of repentance. Repentance is such an important thing for us to understand. You, me, all of us, We have to deal with repentance for the rest of our lives, even if we're Christians. Because our flesh is weak and we are broken. Because we are sinners who continue to be in need of a Savior. Yes, if you're a Christ follower, you have been redeemed, you have been justified, you have a relationship with God the Father. But each and every day you have to continue to choose Repentance. You have to continue to relate to Jesus in that repentance. You have to continue to rely upon Him. Because faith is a journey, it's not a destination. You don't arrive, you continue. And the hope is, as a follower of Jesus, you continue on a path that is constantly growing, becoming more and more Christ-like. That doesn't mean every day you're going to get it right, right? No, we're still going to fall. We're going to have bad times. We're going to have seasons where we plateau or unfortunately we might even be going downhill. But if we look at the big picture, 
your growth should be an upward scale in becoming more and more Christ-like. But the truth of the matter is, on this side of the cross, you won't ever arrive. That's a continual, ongoing, unending process. We have to keep working at and choosing and following and be repenting and relating to Jesus in that way. We can't just rely upon our flesh because our flesh is weak and we will fail. So we need this water of repentance so that we can relate rightly to Jesus as we turn away from our sin and we turn towards Him. But that's not the only word that He gives us here, is it? He said, you got the water. What else did He say? You got the Spirit, right? The Spirit is that we must believe. When Jesus is talking about the Spirit in this text, it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third part of the triune God. It's the Holy Spirit that, that brings to us in our repentance the ability to believe. We must believe. And another word for belief is simply faith, right? Here's the definition of the word belief. Belief is not just facts about Jesus, but it's knowing Jesus. It's trusting Jesus. And it's loving Jesus. If we're going to relate to Jesus rightly as our Savior, as the one who fixes our sick hearts, as the only one who is our hope, we have to do it by repentance, by turning towards Him, by following Him. But we also do it not just by knowing facts about Him, but we have to be in actual relationship with Him and know Him. So it's not enough if we're just going to try to rightly relate to Him intellectually. I mean, we know He was born in Bethlehem, right? We know His mommy and daddy's names, right? But it's not enough just to know that information. We have to take our relationship to a different level. We can't relate with just facts alone. So we have to relate to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, through faith. And just like repentance, for the rest of your lives, you will have to choose to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Every day that you get up, over and over again, we choose to continue to believe in our salvation through Christ. You choose to believe that He loves you. That He's there for you. That He's forgiven you. And that He delights in being in relationship with you. Literally, folks, Jesus rejoices in being in relationship with you. Or to put it simply, Jesus loves you. If you've not heard those words before, hear them today. Jesus loves you. And whatever your conception of love is, however you have ever given your love away and received love, it's all of that, but it's so much more. It's the infinite, never-ending, never-stopping love of God. It's far greater, far deeper, far richer, far more generous, far more forgiving, far more merciful, far more gracious than any love you ever have or ever will receive. And just as I, I love hearing my son say, Daddy, or, or in fact, there's a third category of voice that he uses when he speaks to me. When I know my son is really, really in a happy mood. When he's He's in his happy place. He's just, life is good. He feels safe. He's well fed. He's had plenty of time on his Xbox and playing with Legos and his little buckets are all filled. Instead of calling me dad, when he says dad, dad, right? Dad is sharp. That usually means he wants something. Dad. He evicts me a sandwich. Dad. Dad. That's not a bad thing. And when things are going pretty well, Daddy, Daddy. But when things are just right, he says, Dada. Dada. When he says Dada, when he walks up to me, he says, Dad. I know in that moment, he doesn't want to hug, he doesn't want to cuddle. If he walks up and says, Dada. 
I know I can put my arm around him. I can pull him in. I can get a hug. He'll sit on my lap. I can give him some tickles. We can have some wiggles and giggles together. When he, when he calls me Dada, he's relating to me differently, more deeply, more intimately. I know he wants to linger. He wants to hang out. He wants to cuddle. He wants to be close to me. And in the same way, the God of the Bible, through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, wants to relate in this way to you. You are his sons and daughters if you are in Christ. And he wants to have relationship with you. Because he loves you. And just like repentance, we need to choose faith over and over again. Yes, the world can be hard and difficult. Yes, we will be disappointed. Yes, there's times where we're going to be lonely. Yes, we are going to get sick. And people we love will betray us. And, and people who are meant to protect us won't. It can be scary out there. And if we're not careful, we can choose doubt rather than choosing to believe. What it means to rightly relate to God, our Creator, Father, on a daily basis, is for us to repent as in the water Jesus was talking about, turning towards Jesus and away from our sin. And then it also means for us to believe. Belief. This is a real and mysterious thing. And Jesus actually gives us an illustration in this passage so that we might understand it. He uses the illustration of wind, doesn't he? We need the wind or the power of the Spirit in order for us to rightly relate to Jesus. I want us to look at that verse again. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I love this. Jesus is saying that the way you can see that repentance, the water, and the belief, the Spirit, are actually happening is you will see it moving in the lives of people. I'll give you a couple more pictures here and we'll wrap this story up. <coughs> you can see, this is a picture I took a number of years ago. This is in just, uh, we were at Fitgers. My wife was a Scottish Highlands dance instructor and uh, she used to teach, she hasn't for the last few years, but. Um, we would go up to Fitgers and they would have a dance competition in Duluth once a year. And if you've been to Fitgers, they have a, a beautiful green space that overlooks the, the lake on the backside of Fitgers there in Duluth. And so uh, they, they, they will have back there a bunch of people jumping around doing Scottish Highland dances to bagpipes, right? And so uh, we would go up there and we'd have all this. Well, so happened this particular weekend of the competition, there was a portion of a regatta, a boat race, that was supposed to go on at the same time. And so we got there early because the competition starts at like 8.30 and my wife's students want to start warming up before that and practicing and all that. So we're there really early in the morning. I think we were there by 6.45 or 7. And, and uh, at about 7.30, these boats all made their way out just right off from where we were. We could see them very clearly. And that was at about, I don't know, maybe 7.30. And then they were sitting there waiting. And then somebody said, oh yeah, there's this boat race going today, blah, blah, blah. Well, then at about 7.45, a fog rolls in. And that's why this picture is kind of blurry, because it was really quite foggy. So this fog rolls in, and as the fog rolls in, the wind stopped. And as you can see, these are sailboats. You ever tried to watch a sailboat race with no wind? If you haven't, it's boring. So we hear this horn go off that signals the start of the race. And they sit there. And you know, there's dancing going on, and there's, there's bagpipes, and the boats keep sitting there. And they sit there. And they sit there. Finally, after about 45 minutes, whew, like, like you, you, you can just feel that little tickle on your skin. Just a breath of wind starting to come down the hill of Duluth. And immediately, the sails puff. They puffed a little bit more. And pretty soon the wind gets a little stronger. Pretty soon boats are starting to move and disappear and the fog starts to clear and 
off they go, and I have no idea where they went because they were out of my sight, but they moved. And I don't know if you've ever been on a sailboat. I've spent a, a, a good bit of time in sailboats. I used to run a Boy Scout camp. That had a, we had a 27-foot-long sailboat, and it was awesome. It was fun. I loved riding on the sailboat. Sailboats are awesome because they don't, they don't hardly make any noise other than the sails, right? You don't have the drone of a motor. You don't have the smell of the gas and all that kind of stuff. you got the sail. And if you've never been on a sailboat, when you're on a sailboat, when the wind blows, that sail catches that wind. But what does it do to the boat? It begins to tip that boat over a little bit, doesn't it? And the harder the wind blows and the faster you go, the further that boat begins to tip. And if you've never sailed before, that can be a little unsettling your first time you go, right? Because the harder the wind blows and the faster you go, the more and more and more that boat starts to go. But if you don't know about sailboats, they have a giant keel underneath the water, a big heavy part that balances out whatever forces are up above. So you're not going to tip over, don't worry about it. But when the wind starts to blow, you can see it. You can see the sails. You can see the waves. You can see the splash and spray of the water as the boat moves, right? You can see what begins to happen. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And this imagery that Jesus is using about the wind is, is very important. I don't want to miss it. Because one of the ways that our souls are meant to be encouraged over and over and over again is this, is this watching of the wind, of the seeing of the wind blowing, of it feeling the sails in other people, right? What does that look like to us, though? Well, it's kind of easy, actually. It's something you see every day, whether or not you notice it. Every time you sit down with your family before a meal and you pray, that's a little wind in the sail of the Spirit, a little movement. Every time you sit down and pick up your Bible to read, every time you see somebody loving somebody and serving somebody, every time you see somebody saying, oh, I'm sorry for that and repenting and asking for forgiveness, Every time you do something like that, that's the, the wind of the Spirit in your sail. Every time we gather here in the name of Jesus, that's a little bit of the wind of the Spirit. Every time you come and listen to me yell at you about Jesus, that's a little wind of the Spirit. It's the wind blowing in your life. Vacation Bible school. Sunday school, Wednesday evening programming, sitting down with missionaries, sharing with other people your love for Jesus. That is all the wind of the Spirit blowing in your life. If you get up on Christmas morning and you read the Christmas story, that's the wind of the Spirit blowing. And on and on and on I could go, giving you examples of the wind of the Spirit that blows. That's how God wants us to relate to Him. He wants us to see Him as the wind blowing in our lives. We don't know where it came from. We don't know where it's going. But we can see the work that it's doing. A couple of weeks ago, I was laying in bed in one of those weird states where you're between sleep and awake, right? Just that odd middle, like... You're not quite asleep, you're not quite awake. But I had this feeling that somebody was watching me. Now there's only three people that live in my house. My wife was still laying next to me. So I'm like, all right, who's there? It's me, Daddy. It's Justice. He was standing. I don't know how we feel that. It's like some weird human thing. But he was standing all the way by the door. But yet I felt like somebody was watching me. And I was only like half awake. But I knew he was there. Okay, well, what's wrong, buddy? He wouldn't have come in if there wasn't something wrong. I had a dream. So, we talked about that for a few minutes. I really don't want to get out of bed, frankly. Oh, what'd you dream about, buddy? What's going on? Tell me about it. So he told me, like, all right, buddy, you don't have to worry. Moths won't eat you. Nothing to worry about. You're okay. That, that, that can't happen. There's no reality where that's the case. But you see, he wanted to relate to me in that moment. He was afraid. He needed some comfort. 
What he needed was his daddy in that moment. He wanted to feel safe. He wanted to feel protected. He wanted to know that everything was going to be okay. He didn't need some information about how the universe works. He just needed to know it was going to be all right. And in the same way, you and I are meant to relate to Jesus as the Savior of our souls, as the one who makes our unhealthy hearts well again. We need to go to Him and turn to Him, learn to rely upon Him, accept the love from Him, to be heard by Him, to bring Him all glory, honor, and praise and submit to Him along the way. We need to continue to choose to be in relationship and to go to Him in our need. This is what you and I have been repeatedly invited into in our relationship with Jesus. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your struggles are. It doesn't matter who you are or where you came from. God loves you. And He wants to know you on an intimate level. He doesn't just want to be your teacher. He wants to be your Lord and your Savior. That is what the message of John, the whole book of John, is about. It's about getting to know Him. And that's what this passage in John 3, 1 through 8 was today. Knowing Him at a level that's more than just teacher. But it's Dada, Abba, Father, Jesus, my Savior. I love you. And He loves you. That is what John has for us today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for what is true. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of repentance. And Lord, help us over and over again choose to turn from our sins and to turn to you, to put our hope and trust in you. Lord God, we want to walk in faith. We want to grow in faith. Lord, it doesn't matter where we're at, where we're at on that path, if we're just new to faith or we're old to faith. We need to continue to turn to you, to know you rather than just know of you. God, give us the strength to do that. And God, as we do that, send the wind across our souls. Show us where you are active and working in our lives and in this world. Refresh and renew us. May we see with your eyes the work that you are doing. And God, may we every day choose you because you have chosen us. Oh God, we thank you for your love that exceeds anything we could ever imagine. We could not earn it. We do not deserve it. Yet, freely you give it nonetheless. Truly you are good and we praise you. Lord Jesus, we bless your name. We thank you that you love us in a way that that we could never return. And God, we thank you that we can continue moving forward in our lives, following after you. Humbly, Lord, we submit to you. We turn from our sins. We repent. We turn towards you and put our hope and trust in you. Lord Jesus, continue to be with us, blessing us, protecting and providing for us all of the days of our lives that we might know, love, and serve you. For it's in your beautiful, high, and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you for coming out to Glory Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've taken time out of your busy weekends to be here. If you need some prayer, we will have a prayer team here up front following worship in just a moment. They would love to pray with you. Otherwise, go forth, seek the wind in your sails this week, see God working in your lives, and go and be a blessing to all you may encounter. Go and serve your King. Amen.